Okay, so welcome to this fifth lecture on clinical reasoning. And this one, we're going to talk about probability. And here is our framework. And we're going to be in this box here, prioritizing a differential diagnosis. And in order to have the skills to do this, we need to learn first about probabilities and thresholds. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And through the course of this video, we're going to build this diagram here, which is a probability space where we have a diagnosis, as shown by this yellow box, uh, is going to be pushed into one of three categories, either the trash it, test it, or treat it category. The treat it category means we say that they, our patient has that diagnosis and we're willing to start treatment. The trash it one says that our patient does not have that diagnosis and we're going to no longer consider this diagnosis. And the test it one, we're unsure and we need to do more testing to figure out. Uh, so here are our objectives. We're going to define these concepts and determine how we're going to set thresholds. So let's look first at uh, this forecast. And you can see here that uh, the weatherman is calling for a 40% chance of rain at 8 a.m. on this day. So should you take your umbrella? I don't know. Now there's a 40% chance of rain. So it, it could rain or it might not rain. And either way, the weatherman is right. The, the, there is just a probability of rain. And so you got to weigh the benefit of having an umbrella versus the cost of lugging that thing around all day. And so the probability of rain is 40%. Now let's talk about probability here in the context of flipping a penny. Now when you flip a penny, you have uh, one of two options, heads or tails. So what's the probability of getting heads? Well, it's the number of options that we want over the number of total options. So there's one possibility we want heads over two two total possibilities, heads or tails, two. So one of two, one over two is 50%. And the same thing, the probability of getting tails is uh, 50%. And another thing that you'll note is if you add up the probabilities of all the pos possible options, it should add up to 100%. And so this is the formula the number of outcomes you're looking for over the number of possible outcomes. So the number of outcomes you're looking for, in this case heads, one, over the number of possible outcomes, two, heads or tails, 50%. So now let's look at dice. And so what is the probability of getting a three when you roll dice? Well, we have one possibility here of getting three out of six possible outcomes. And so uh, it's a one out of six or approximately 17% chance of getting a three. So again, there's our formula. Now, what if let's look at a different one. What is the probability of getting a number less than three? So that really means two options, getting a one or a two. Well, how many ways can we do it? We can do that in two ways. We can do it by getting a one or by getting a two. So there are two outcomes that we're looking for, either a one or a two, and there's six possible outcomes. And so two over six equals one third or a 33.3% chance of rolling a number less than three. Uh, so the other thing that I'd like to say about probability is it goes between and it ranges from zero to a hundred. Zero means that it's absolutely not going to happen. Like what is the chance of rolling a 12 on a six-sided dice? It's not going to happen, right? Because it's it's just not going to happen. There is no 12. So there's a zero percent chance of that happening. And what's the chance of rolling a number? Well, all of these are numbers. And assuming it doesn't land on a corner and balance in some strange way, uh, you're going to get a number. So there's a 100% chance of getting a number. So we talked about probability in the weather and rolling dice, as well as coin flips. But now let's look at it for diagnoses. And so here is, uh, again, probability goes from 0 to 100. And you you can have the probability that a particular patient has a diagnosis. And that can go anywhere from 0 to 100. And so let's say we have a person with uh, headaches. And here is our diagnosis. We're considering migraines, intracranial bleed, and meningitis. And I think there's an 87% chance that this person has migraines, a 41% chance that they have an intracranial bleed, and an 11% uh, or a 12% chance that they have meningitis. And so, again, let me, t let me say something. You can never be 100% or 0% sure of a diagnosis when it comes to medicine. Because unlike dice, uh, where we said you can, you're either going to get a number or you're never going to roll a 12, you can never be sure that a patient doesn't have a diagnosis or does have a diagnosis because there's just too many variables 
there. So you could be sure enough, but you, you can never be 100% uh, sure. So in this case, let's say migraines, and we said there's an 87% chance that they had migraines. And if we said that this patient had migraines, there's an 87% chance we're right, but then there's also a 13% chance that we're wrong and they don't have migraines. Similarly, for meningitis, if we said that there was an 11% chance that they have meningitis, then, uh, and we we say they don't have meningitis, then 89% chance that we're right. But there's also 11% chance that we're wrong. And so we can never reach that 100% certainty. So we have to get an answer that is good enough. And so that's what these thresholds mean. If you pass above this threshold, then we're going to say, you know what, that's good enough. I'm, I'm not sure that, 100% uh, sure that this person has migraines, but I'm sure enough. I got enough data to say that they do. And I'm not, and I'm not a, you know, 0% sure this person has meningitis, or conversely, 100% sure they don't have meningitis, but I'm sure enough. I'm 89% sure that they don't have meningitis, right? And so that's what these thresholds are. Crossing the threshold allows you to, uh, to say, that uh, it's you know the answer is good enough. Now this break this probability space we're going to break it up into three zones: the trash it, test it, and treat it zone. In the trash it zone, we said that we're sure enough that they don't have the diagnosis that we're not going to pursue it any further. We're just going to drop it. In the treat it zone, we said that we're sure enough that they do have the diagnosis. We're not a hundred percent sure, but we're pretty you know we're sure enough that we're going to start treatment. And in this middle zone, the test it zone. We're neither sure enough to drop it nor sure enough to treat it, so we need more information. We need further testing. And so what we need to do is collect evidence until we can move every diagnosis in our differential out of the test-it zone and into the treat-it zone or into the trash-it zone. And evidence in favor of a diagnosis, if you have something that suggests a diagnosis, it pushes the diagnosis up. And it might not push you all the way up into the treatment zone, the treat-it zone, but it if it doesn't, then you need to collect more and more until you finally get into the treated zone. Similarly, if you have evidence that uh, works against a diagnosis, it pushes the probability downward. And so you want to get it eventually pushed into the trash it zone. So how do you set these thresholds? Uh, that's, to do that, you need to weigh the cost of each of these zones. And so you need to weigh the cost of treatment the cost of testing, and the cost of doing nothing. Much like when we talked about with the weather, the cost of carrying an umbrella versus the cost of not carrying an umbrella, right? Uh, so that's what we have to do here. So let's say, let's talk just about the treatment threshold here. So to determine where to set the treatment threshold, we have to, we have to weigh against each other the cost of treatment and the cost of testing. So if we want to move this threshold up, then what happens? then you can see that the testing zone becomes bigger and the treated zone becomes smaller. So you're going to want to do this when you have treatments that are dangerous. We want to be less likely to treat and more likely to test. So let's say that we have appendicitis. Okay, and we have high probability that it's appendicitis, but we're not sure. All right. Uh, and the treatment for it is surgery. Uh, so you say, okay, well, we can do a CAT scan, right? And the CAT scan is relatively safe. I mean, there are some risks with CAT scans, with radiation and contrast, etc. But the, but you know, we don't want to take someone to the operating room unnecessarily because that's surgery. And so we raise this threshold here. Now, you know, conversely, let's talk about reflux. All right, we're pretty sure that somebody has, you know, heartburn. Uh, the testing requires either a blood test or a costly endoscopy where they stick a, something down their throat, and so that's potentially dangerous. And the treatment is pretty safe. It's just stop taking eating spicy foods and take some antacids. So you might want to pull this threshold down, right? So now you're making the treated zone bigger and the tested zone smaller because we're less likely to test because, you know what, the testing, it has some cost to it, and the treatment is fairly benign. So let's try that, right? Now let's go look at the testing threshold, all right? So we're going to weigh here the cost of testing versus the cost of doing nothing. Uh, so in this case, uh, we can move up the threshold. What happens? We shrink the test it zone here and we we grow the trash it zone. So this is when you have tests that are dangerous uh, and it's cheap or safe to do nothing. So let's talk about heartburn again. So maybe we're not 100% sure, but we really don't think it's heartburn, right? But we don't want to test for it because what happens if we miss heartburn? Is it going to kill someone? No, they'll just have some more heartburn. They'll be fine. So we, we're, we're okay with that. We're willing to accept that risk because it's safe to do nothing there. 
but doing that blood test might be expensive or doing the endoscopy might be dangerous and so we feel like you know i, I didn't think it was uh, reflux to begin with i'm willing to to drop it my suspicion was low now let's look about a different case when we want to push this threshold this testing threshold down all right so what happens here is the trash it zone becomes much smaller and the test it zone becomes much bigger so let's say that we're yeah, we're you know mildly worried that uh, someone might have an ectopic pregnancy. That's a pregnancy that's in the tubes or in the wrong place. It's potentially deadly if you miss this. So the cost of doing nothing is pretty dangerous. They, the person can die, right? And the testing is easy. You just do a pregnancy test and see if they're pregnant because if they're not pregnant, then they don't have an ectopic pregnancy. And um, I'm, of course, simplifying this. If they are pregnant, you have to do other tests. But let's say that we were we had low suspicion to begin with. All right, and so then we can push this down. So we're growing the testing zone because a testing of the pregnancy test is very cheap and the, uh, the cost of doing nothing is very expensive. It's potentially death. And so that's it. So that's our video on probabilities and thresholds. Uh, you know, we d defined a probability space and we defined thresholds, which once we cross these thresholds, then we are able to either say a patient has a diagnosis and start treating it, or so they don't have a diagnosis and just trash it. If we're not able to get into that zone, then we need to get more information and we need to test it. We need to get more testing further until we can push these diagnoses into those areas. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.